From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Good morning and welcome to Montana This Morning on this Monday, August 28th. I'm Alina Howder in for Augusta McDonald. First this morning, summer is coming to an end and while we can't forget fall, the nearest ski resort in the area is already getting ready for winter. Q2's Charlie Kleps shows us the $3 million upgrade now under construction atop Red Lodge Mountain. Now here's an area you're probably not familiar with this time of year, Red Lodge Mountain. But for its workers, they've been up all summer helping put together the brand new chairlift. A massive project, but one they hope makes a huge impact on the mountain. Regardless if you've seen it or not, it's pretty darn cool. There's been a lot of moving parts at Red Lodge Mountain this summer. Well, it's not often we can pull something like this off. You know, we're a small to mid-size operation. Mid-size operation or not, the mountain is in the middle of adding a high-speed chairlift to the base area, a nearly $3 million project and one that takes a lot of work. We've had a crew of 12 working just on the steel, the concrete, this side of it, a lot of six, seven days, like since the snow melted. Lift manager Larry Freeman has been a part of the construction process since the snow melted, but the planning has been going on for years. This has been fantastic to finally get the steel in the air and be doing it, really showing the progress, you know, so last week it was still a bunch of steel laying in the parking lot and now all of a sudden, you know, you're going to look in and it's a recognizable ski lift. The lift will be replacing the old Miami Beach lift, which was built in 1973. The new lift is faster and goes further up the mountain, creating a much more versatile option for visitors. The old lift was probably at best 450 pe people per hour could get up the lift. This one will be 1,800 people per hour can get up the lift. And I think that's really gonna change how people use the ski area and really just the overall experience. A big investment, but one the mountain hopes will be worth it, adding a new element on the slopes. Time will tell. If nothing else, our longtime customers will enjoy a faster way out of the base area and uh, access to more terrain easily. In Red Lodge, Charlie Kleps, MTN News. And now it's time for a quick check of weather with Miller, what I like to call Miller time. It's Miller time, yes. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you, Alina. Good to see you. Question for you, do you like hot or cold weather? Or I like the in-between. In-between. Well, we have a chance. A little bit of everything this week. It's not going to get cold, but it's going to get cooler after a couple of days where we're going to stay above average. In fact, we're just continuing the trend over the last couple of days where we've stayed above the norm. A good six degrees above yesterday as we wrap up the final weekend of August. Where's the year gone? It was milder than normal to start the day. Dry yesterday, but for the month, we've got 1.29 inches. So we're uh, well above average for the month in terms of our moisture total and we're pacing ahead for the year. In fact, we've already met our yearly total. We're about two, about two tenths of an inch ahead and we could still see a little bit of rain later today. On the monthly thing, I just want to mention Mile City, a shout out to you. You've had 2.84 inches so far this August. That's the fourth wettest August on record since we started keeping records back in 1937. But pretty dry stretch uh, continuing there in Mile City. In fact, I don't have any rain for you uh, this week. Uh, 61 right now at the airport, humidity at 64%, winds out of the southwest at about 14 miles an hour. We do have a little bit of rain this morning around Sheridan, around the uh, Bighorns, uh, the foothills there, even Hardin, maybe Forsyth could get a little bit of rain. Temperatures right now in the 50s and 60s will go 80s and some 90s the next couple of days before a cool down comes in. And we'll tell you more about that with the main forecast coming up here in just a bit. Oh, excited for the cooler weather. It'd be nice. It'd be nice. It's not going to stick around, mm. but we have a little bit of a, a little bit of a relief as we get into the middle of the week. Just a tease. Just a tease, yeah. Oh, well, thank you, Miller. Okay. Awesome. And this morning, we're meeting an inspiring group of women who just completed a nearly 600-mile outdoor adventure powered by friendship. Q2's Haley Monaco has their story. Audio Diary, day three. This is Audio Diary, day four. It is day five. We do think we are the first woman team to to do this and and camp along the way and not just go in a hotel every night. Happy 26th day on the river. We just had our last supper. Nearly one month and hundreds of miles later, four women living in different states can now say they came together to complete a journey very few have ever done. Started um, in Gardner. 
Montana. Floating 570 miles on the Yellowstone River. We ended at the confluence there where the Yellowstone meets the Missouri. It was a trip that took two years of planning. An idea first brought about by Celesta Hallam Barwick. I originally wanted to float all the way to Louisiana until I ran the numbers and realized I was not taking a year off of work. Um, so then I just decided to do the whole Yellowstone and invited my daughter. MTN News had the opportunity to speak with three of the four women who were on the trip about the unique adventure they decided to take. All about the ups. I think it was really healing to be in nature for that long. And we had such a good um, girl empowerment vibe on our boat. And the downs. Was there any moment that any of you were like, I can't do this anymore? <laughs> not me i was in it for the long haul other people may oh, have mom, you had a... okay there's a video of a snake crawling under her tent and like literally her and sherry are like i'm out i'm done i'm done but they powered through every hardship even a fear of snakes and made it out on the other end Sherry smith Holly shared something special she learned about herself along the way. Just turning 50 and dealing with health problems, she feared she might not be able to complete the trip. I learned that um, I'm not broken and that I can still keep going. So uh, that was a uh, huge exciting for me, like just more empowering that life's not over at 50 yet. They all made memories that will last a lifetime and even have plans for more river adventures. We'd like to hit every river in Montana now. Well, we're going to try. There's a lot of them. We're going to try. In Billings, Haley Monaco, MTN News. New this morning, attorneys for former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows heads to federal court in Georgia. It's the first hearing in the Georgia state election interference case against former President Donald Trump and 18 co-defendants. Meadows is seeking to have his state case moved to federal court and continues to deny any wrongdoing. For former President Donald Trump, a picture is worth more than $7 million. That's the amount Trump's campaign says he has raised since Thursday when he was booked at the Fulton County Jail in Georgia on charges that he illegally schemed to overturn the 2020 election in the state and became the first former president in U.S. history to ever have a mugshot taken. Last Friday alone, the campaign brought in $4.18 million, its highest grossing day to date. Gold Star families who lost loved ones in Afghanistan in the final days of U.S. operations there will meet in Washington this week to mark two years since the fall of Kabul. Reporter Joe St. George brings us a look at how the political debate about leaving that country is still raising questions two years later, as well as still invoking pain for families who paid the ultimate sacrifice. The end of August and beginning of September conjures up different emotions for different people, but for some Gold Star families who lost loved ones during the fall of Afghanistan. Now, two years ago, this time of year will always be marked with some pain and some sadness and questions for those who were in charge. I said, Mom, Ryan's dead. Two years have passed, but it isn't any easier for Paula Canal self to talk about the death of her son, Army Staff Sergeant Ryan Christian Canals. This is the final message he sent her on Snapchat. This past Saturday, marking two years since he was killed in a bombing in Afghanistan as the U.S. withdrew troops after a nearly 20-year presence. Canals was one of 13 American service members killed in what is now known as the Abbey Gate bombing. I just, I couldn't believe that Ron was gone. Since that time, Self has turned grief into action, which will be on full display this week in Washington as other Gold Star families who lost loved ones during the U.S. withdrawal will participate in a Tuesday roundtable on Capitol Hill, not only to mark two years, but also to bring attention to what happened. Who is going to be taking responsibility for the loss of lives and that debacle? Is it just the military that's to be blamed? Or was it because of political decisions? The event occurring as Republicans on Capitol Hill continue their investigation into what happened within the last month, the State Department turning over to Congress around 300 related documents. Meanwhile, a separate bipartisan Afghanistan War Commission continues its multi-year look into the conflict. The White House earlier this year posting a 12-page review about the Afghanistan withdrawal on its website, in which it placed some blame on the Trump administration for allowing the Taliban to become so 
organized. The White House writing, we continue to mourn the loss of the 13 heroes and vow to continue to support their families. The question of how Americans lost their lives isn't the only political debate happening two years later. There remains frustration by some that the U.S. isn't issuing more visas to help more citizens of Afghanistan now trapped under Taliban rule. As for self, she just hopes this issue is on the minds of voters this election. Who's going to take responsibility for causing such chaos? Joe St. George, Scripps News, Washington. This morning, we're learning more about the three victims of the tragic shooting at a Dollar General store in Jacksonville, Florida, over the weekend. All three who were shot and killed were black. The suspect, a white man, also turned the gun on himself. As CBS's Wendy Gillette reports, police are describing the attack as racially motivated. The families that have lost someone. A city in mourning. Residents of Jacksonville came together for a prayer vigil after police say a white man gunned down three black people at a Dollar General store Saturday. No more division. No more hate. We are going to do what we need to do to make sure that evil does not triumph in the state of Florida. Authorities say the gunman targeted two shoppers and a store employee because of their race. The victims were identified as 29-year-old Gerald Gallian, 52-year-old Angela Carr, and 19-year-old A.J. Lagur, who worked at the store. It's not fair. Gallian's relatives describe him as a great father to his young daughter, who never missed a beat. I don't know how to tell her that her dad is not coming back. I don't know how to talk. I don't have the words. The Jacksonville Sheriff's Office released this surveillance video of the suspected shooter, identified as 21-year-old Ryan Palmetter, wearing tactical gear and armed with a handgun and an AR-15 rifle that was painted with swastikas. Authorities say he opened fire on his victims inside and outside of the store before he shot and killed himself. He wanted to kill black people. His writings and his manifestos were, were uh, the diary of a madman. The sheriff said the suspect bought the guns legally but had been involuntarily committed for a mental health examination six years ago. Before the shooting, police say the gunman was spotted at the historically black Edward Waters University. The FBI has opened a civil rights investigation. Wendy Gillette, CBS News. The White House says President Biden spoke to Jacksonville's mayor and sheriff to offer his full support to the people of the city. Florida governor and presidential candidate Ron DeSantis was booed during a brief speech in which he declared the state of Florida is behind the community. In a statement about the shooting, Vice President Kamala Harris invoked today's 60th anniversary of the March on Washington, adding, quote, every person in every community in America should have the freedom to live safe from gun violence. On this day in 1963, about 250,000 people flooded D.C. to protest for civil rights and better job opportunities. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech at the event. President Biden and VP Harris will meet with King's children today to commemorate the historic occasion.